Okay. So welcome all. This is what a 79th PC open discussion. And today we'll continue what we left in the in the last week. And then I did give it a try about that Excel thing. And maybe I'm not that Excel geek. So I might need some help, but I think that there are ways that you can create relationship with the other data set and then use it based on how, you know the uses that you think would be useful for it. So we'll have a look if time permits then. So where do you register? You register here every week after this meeting. Normally I update this link after creating the meeting and uh, the link gets updated by Max on Sunday. So that's the way to kind of register for the next meeting. So let's go and understand about what's we haven't discussed about what's new in 2022 release wave one. So the first one that we were talking about in past also was about consolidating customer and vendor balances. So if you had played with the preview releases of Business Central, you would have noticed that on a customer card and also on a vendor on the vendor card, there's a new field that's available, which is balance as vendor on the customer card. And as you go into the vendor card, there is a field balance as customer, which is not a flow field. So that means it's not getting calculated based on a relationship, but there is actual code which is setting these fields up. Now I was trying it by doing uh, without reading about it. And uh, at the end, these things will find out that as in why you will use if you, uh, this feature is that you might have an entity from which you also purchase, but you also sell them. So in your business central environment, they are also your customer as well as your vendor. So instead of making unnecessary payments and receipts, you can using this feature at the end of the day, you can net off the balances and send them uh, one single payment about it. But how you set it up is it's not based on the vendor number and the customer number. You need to start using the contacts and then from contacts, you will create a contact as customer and then as also as a vendor. And only that way it will create that link behind the scene and we'll update these fields. So let's get into the product and see that. So this is a customer which is created from contact. Where is the contact info? Here. Okay. Now this is already a contact and then uh, of type customer, you can surely navigate into the function menu. This is a vendor. Okay. Now let's create a customer for it. Function create as customer. So once you create this as a customer, now it is also a customer that you have. So let's see that this is vendor number thousand. And then there is a customer C0110, which is a customer. And now here you can see what is balance of this as a vendor, which seems a flow field at this point. Okay. Yeah, which then let's see the filters what it applied. It applied on the vendor number. Now this number or this flow field kind of works behind the scene based on what the relationship business contact relationship, I guess that's the table behind the scene, which links a contact to a customer and to a vendor. So if you want to use it, then you need to make sure that you use the contact and then create a customer or a vendor from that. So the linkage is set. Now the the kind of the feature is majorly around payments. So when you go and do a payment journal entry for this, okay, and let's make a payment. Let's make a payment if required on customer number thousand. 
let's try to let them then in the top ribbon you have on the prepare menu where you have suggest vendor payment and all you have a new action here to net off customer and vendor balances so if you do that it kind of populates a report which nets out the 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 payments based on the customer record and the vendor record. If I say one order on suggestion, okay. And then you can limit it to a particular vendor or as it's all right there. There's nothing right now, I guess, at this moment. For this one, so let me make an entry for this customer that we created. Okay, let's create a sales invoice. And <laughs> so now we have this invoice posted. And then we'll go here. Let's go back to payment journal. Testing to prepare, net off this. Okay. So now if we see this, it created a entry for the invoice and which is applied to my posted sales invoice that I did. And then this is applicable to what? This is my apply. Oh, this is the vendor ledger entry that's there. Yes, this is not the entry that we created today. So it, it created a consolidated entries based on whatever is yet to be processed for this customer and vendor entity, which is eventually a one single entity. So, Sandeep, sir, you were saying that there are business scenarios that can deal with it, right? In the past, when we discussed about it. Yes, uh, basically, um, there are scenarios where we require it actually, these things. Like uh, one of um, my customer, what they do is they sell the raw material to the vendor, right. and vendor um, adds their own material and then send it back. So only the few components are sent. Okay. So if if the bomb has say fifty items, they send ten, which right. are there, which have their uh, you know kind of um, what you can say source control or some something of that sort, where they have got the patent. So oh. in those scenarios, this is pretty useful, and they do the net payment to the vendor. So yeah, let's see. I haven't had the situation, but I'm pretty sure we'll do a little bit deep into it as we find the uses of this. And uh, you know, it's better to know about it while we're talking to our customer. It it adds that value. So that's what new about on the customer and vendor balances consolidation. Now let's talk about. A feature which was being worked by Microsoft for a very long time now. Initially, it was released, it was optional on journals that you can enable and disable it. But now they have also expanded it to the documents also. So while your users are working on the system, and if they most in most of the cases when they are new, they don't know the system very well. This check functionality, as I said earlier, was available in the journals, which was an optional feature that you can turn on and off. But now it's also available on your documents. And you can still toggle it based on the feature management, that's for sure. It's still not a by default feature which is enabled. But also you can even if it becomes a normal feature in the future where it is not toggled on the feature management, you can still enable and disable it from a setup. So what you do first is as if you want to use it, or if, you, if your customer want to use it today, you'll have to go into the feature management. And then there is this feature of check 
document in journal while work while you work. Now, as we have talked about this in past, this will become uh, a default feature in quarter two of 2023. But I have already enabled it. If you haven't, you can. And then this is a feature that you can, like, I'm pretty sure, go back and disable if you don't like it. And if so, if there is no data update, and that's why it's a feature that you can toggle on and off based on whenever you need it. Once you have enabled this on environment as of today, uh, it gives you uh, clues on your documents and on your journals using a fact box. To showcase errors that uh, are being generated as you're typing values into it. Now, once you have done that, as I was saying, that they have also added on general as a setup that do you want to use this feature or not? In future, when it becomes in quarter two of 2023, a default feature, there is a enable date check. Date enter. Okay, so it's only for the dates. I thought they have done it for everything, but it seems only for the dates that are being entered on the journals and on your documents. So if you are just reviewing the document, uh, you can in that case turn on and off the enable date check. That's the only thing I guess that you can enable or disable. So let's have a look while creating a document because I have seen it on journals. So let's try to do a let's do a purchase invoice. And then there is this detail tab where there should be a fact box. Let me create a new one. Maybe it's in the card. No, it's not still here. Let me do personalize. Maybe they have haven't enabled that by default. This is approval and the detail. Hmm. Oh, here it is coming on the top. Start validating data and documents in general while you work. Enable this for me. Okay. So as a user, you can also enable or disable it. Even if your organizations have uh, your company have enabled it, you can always go into my settings. And then here you have this notification section where there are different kind of notification that if you want to enable or disable for yourself. So let me see which one is disabled here. Show document check fact box. So if you don't like to use this feature because you are an advanced user, you can just turn it off like I have done it. But if you are new and you want to have system continuously checking while you're working, you can just enable it here. So now you as a user, you can decide do you want or not. It's not a yes or no for the company and then you get the issue total here. And it says now that the buy from vendor number is mandatory. OK, let's key that in. Now it says there is nothing to post. That's weird. That doesn't make okay. Does it say that I need to have an item? Okay. Uh, do I need to have quantity? Or let me refresh. That's what it says. Nothing to post. Okay, let it refresh. Now that's misleading. They should have been something. Okay, let me do this. No shoes on. Okay. So was that for the line? There's, there's nothing to post, or was that for this? No, that was not for the vendor invoice number. Can you enter one the lines once again? Okay. And Okay, yes, sir. And now do preview posting. In the posting oh. button. Posting button. Posting button. Oh, yeah. Preview posting. 
you need to enter document number uh, on the so vendor invoice number yeah but it should oh now it refreshes what so it doesn't refresh on the same page it doesn't refresh on the same page it, it looks like that. it seems so yeah that doesn't sound that good and what if if i remove this and refresh this this is good. Otherwise, so it's this good. is good, but yeah, otherwise it's good. But the the first priority should be given to the vendor invoice number at this point, right? Not to nothing to post. It must be the error, first error that must be coming now. Oh, so it's coming from the purchase post check header posting. Which says the what? Check background document and nothing else. Hmm. Yeah, as in, let me do preview posting now. What does it say? Nothing to post. Okay, that also says nothing to post. So it's basically it the first error. When yeah, that's kind error. of the first error because there is nothing to post at this moment. But when this is keyed in, why I'll have to do, why I have to do a preview posting? I guess it's my hmm. now it refreshes. You need to move out and then come back in to see the actual error message. Oh yeah, oh, just a bug. Just a bug. Hope so. <laughs> but it's hard to update the document as it's happening on the fact box. But yeah, it seems good. If they can kind of fix, and as we are saying, that it will prioritize lines first, and before it's kind of calling the posting routine uh, checks that are available already in the code unit, and then that enables it. But okay, let's see. It seems that they have also made some enhancement on the journals. So if I go into payment journal, we already had some entries there. Okay, lines check three, line with issue one, issue total one. What is that issue? Amount must have a value in line number thousand. Okay, okay, let's remove this line. Let's see, it refreshes it here. Oh, it does refresh it here. Okay, if I change it to be positive, it should be an error. There is not even a refresh button. Oh, now it refreshes automatically. It's out of balance. Okay, so yeah, in the journal, because it's a line page, it's it's a worksheet page, you might just have to kind of click on the above line or the below line to kind of refresh that. But in the document, because it's just one single entity, it doesn't refresh automatically. To kind of identify are there errors or not, which is cool. But then, how this it's being called from hmm, there's no call stack, which is surprising. It's coming based on. Oh, I guess it's coming out of based on how these are calculated. Because there is no reference to from where this uh, for the journals from where it is being generating that error messages. Like in the invoice, we were able to navigate and see that it's coming from the purchase post. But in the case of journals, it's kind of fetching it. Based on the line that no, you but there's a document the number uh, message is coming now. So this must be coming from the code unit. This cannot come from the bottom. Let's have a look. Let me see if I can open my VS code of the BC20 if I have something somewhere. This is base application. I was playing with document services. Makes it evident. Uh let me turn this in. Okay. 
case, let me open another window. Maybe it's easier to do it from the object designer rather than doing it from here. I'm struggling these days with this OAuth token thing. I'm trying to do automatically and not finding a good reference for it, but that's something else. K19.5 system app. Send me invite anytime. I can help you. Sure. I I am working on building something and uh, not building something, but a requirement with uploading a file to SharePoint. And because they just need it for one process, I did suggest them that extension from Eric. But because there's just one need where they want that file to be uploaded, they don't want to spend that money. I'm trying to fit in there. That's where the first thing comes is to fetch the OAuth token from it. I will send you some samples. Okay, that'll, that'll be great help. Uh, Saurav, we talked about uh, uh, that... what was his name? MSN uh, Raju. Yeah. Yeah, so he wrote about it in the Business Central 15 or the Central 16 uh, time, where there were very limited uh, available in the base Microsoft app. Now, if you look in the base Microsoft app, there are so many things that we have done, which is already yeah. part of the base. So I didn't want yeah. to go that route. I did uh, read about that article, you know, thoroughly. But I'm pretty sure that is most of it is already available in the system right now. So you don't have to kind of go and uh, do everything what he did over there. As in, it's not incorrect, but mm -hmm. there are so many things which are available in base, which you can utilize by default. Mm, right, right. Right, because Actually, back then there was nothing uh, done by Microsoft on OneDrive integrations and all. And now yes. I, think, yes. I don't want to deflect, but where we were earlier, uh, as in when I opened this, this is document service management code unit from Microsoft, which I was reading. Mm -hmm. And it does everything around uh, getting the tokens, and then there are SharePoint things inside it. Right. They have nice. a static thing available in the system to get the tokens and then do the call. So if it is available from the base Microsoft, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If it is done, then we should utilize what is already available in the product, right? Right, right. I was trying to read this and then I was trying I to get the token. Put, I put this. some code on the chat. Just have a look after okay. this. It was working okay. for me. Okay. Yeah, that, that'll be interesting because that's something that everyone who have to do any kind of integrations of the, outside the system, uh, basic authentication is being deprecated or is deprecated now for SaaS. And that's where you need to, under, we all need to understand the OAuth. Uh, so this is standard code. function in the OAuth code unit. That yeah, I did went there. Authorization code. I so did went there and maybe I I did not create the my app correctly. Uh, as in on the Your authorization has nothing to do with it. Authorization has nothing to do with it. Oh, but yeah, this is the OAuth uh, two code unit, right? Which have all these yeah. methods available. Yeah, that's that is where I was spending most of my time today. The code so, which I have shared it is working for this SharePoint. I was trying. Oh, good. That'll be good. Yeah, I'll I'll let you know as I as I dive oh. into it maybe tomorrow. But then, if you see at this page, coming back to where we were, uh, there is a job queue that's being set with this code unit, check general general line background with this code unit in place. Okay, maybe it's in the payment general page. From where it's trying to call this in queue. Oh, 
Uh, let me see what this code unit is. So this is that code unit which runs the check and then it returns the result by setting it on that page. Now uh, it's doing it from check general general line, which is again the standard Microsoft method on code unit. But then it seems a local method here, which then calls the general general line with the check general general line function. And then it does returns the temp error messages, which is then processed and shown into the fact box that's available. Now the part which I'm a little bit confused is that it does it was showing that it sets it on the via via job queue by creating a background task, which seems a time consuming activity. Kind of calculated based on that. If you have a big journal, it may take time to kind of come out with it. Hmm. Yes, so here on page background task completed, background get errors from general like everybody. Hmm. There is so many things that are changing behind the scene, which because we can't see the code now directly, we're kind of leaving it on mercy of Microsoft, most of it. And also we cannot modify it. So that makes it more relevant to not look at it, I guess. Okay. So yeah, that's as in if we have to kind of deep dive into technical of it, maybe we'll do that some other day. But that's what uh, the check document and general while work working is kind of being used. Okay, now let's move some things on onboarding, which we haven't touched. Um, in Business Central 19, if I'm not wrong, or 18, I guess, Microsoft started including uh, the references of community and the help articles in the tell me window, which make which made it a little bit clumsy. If you look at it, PC 19 and you start searching something. Uh, it was hard because it was showing you the pages and then it was also showing you the references or the help articles uh, from the product itself in those windows. So kind of to kind of clean that up, what Microsoft did is also move that section a little bit. So, and it's maybe a little bit hard to kind of differentiate what they did because sometimes we don't pay attention to it. So if you look at this PC 195, if you search for, let's say, any particular page, all the help that Microsoft thinks is relevant to that particular text that you have typed was also shown here. So like posting. So there was exploring page and report, and then there was, let's me see. We used to show it here, I guess, earlier. Posting sales order. Maybe that was on previous version, not on 19. But initially, they kind of loaded all the kind of enhanced this tell me feature to show you articles from community and also some Microsoft Learn portal and everything, which made it a little bit confusing for people who are using the system. So now what they have done in Business Central 20 is they have moved everything here on this section. So in the help and support section, when you come, it provides you the detail about the page you are in and whatever the relevant document or the articles that are available on Microsoft website, uh, based on that page where you are in, will be visible here. So right now, as we are on the role center page, it gives you us 
documents about document and emailing, working with Business Central, add-ins and all. But if you navigate to, let's say, customer, this page will change and it'll show you about create number series, uh, set up a new customer, set up cash customers. And if you move to, let's say, vendor or anywhere else in the system, these articles will change based on where you are so that the user gets the right help and support if he is looking for it. So like if you go to chart of accounts, you will see all the relevant articles and help about how you set up additional currencies, what are invoice round roundings and all. So that all is available. And then this section is easily accessible if you don't like to kind of go into it and search for it. You can just do a control F1 and it'll pop up that help section for you. This talks to you about what this page is about, what it does, why, how it is used, and then also any related articles from Microsoft Talks. But not just that, if you think that you might need something from the community, you can always come down here, you can do the community check and it'll open the uh, Microsoft Community Forum where you can start posting your questions if you have any. It's not still extended to uh, the Learn Portal. I guess this is where they are utilizing the Learn Portal. I'm pretty sure. Let's click on this. This one takes us to the Microsoft Docs. Okay. There is a video so where it takes it. Oh, it's all pointing to Microsoft Docs. They haven't, extend, haven't extended it to the Microsoft Learn Portal. So this becomes your all time support like with other Microsoft product. Uh, Control F1 in this case would be the shortcut to navigate to help and search for things. Like if you have to take a tour of this page, which then invokes uh, the behind the scene. Uh, what we call that? I forgot that word. Teaching tip, yeah. That's supposed to be teaching tip, which is defined in the application either by Microsoft or extended by the partner uh, by using page extensions. That will be visible based on that tool. So this is one thing that is kind of changed or updated into the onboarding areas of Business Central. OK, let's go back and see. So yeah, this talks about these four things. You can navigate to community. You can take a tour of the page if required. You get the help specifically about that page where you are in, and it gives you the relevant article based on the page you are in. And then you can also search on the Microsoft Docs by going into the Microsoft Doc action. Into it. The other enhancement on onboarding, which initially people thought that Oh, this just looks cool, but it is something that maybe Microsoft will not do much into it or will not try to extend this. But it seems uh, there is a good feedback that's coming on it. And Microsoft is enhancing the teaching the features and tools which are available in Business Central. <clears throat> so if you were here last time when this feature was released, we went into detail how easy it is to build it on your pages that you're building by just adding one certain section on your new pages. At the same time, you can also extend it on the base Microsoft pages where you can change or give, provide details about a particular field, a particular action, or a particular you know, page itself that's available on the page, uh, sorry, on the screen. In this version, they have also extended it to add hyperlink into this uh, teaching tips section, where if you are on a certain section and you want to open up a separate page, show your users that, oh, if you have to do this, you should make sure that you have templates set up. Now, instead of this searching about customer template, you can also do a hyperlink on your teaching tip. where you can say that, OK. With customer template, you can create new customers, but then 
you don't customer don't have to go uh, user don't have to go and search for customer template here using the teaching tip you can click on it which will open the customer template page which have a very static way of how you do it anything that you have to make bold you have to place it between three dots uh, or no not three i guess two two stars i forgot there were two stars you need to keep that text between two stars and then two stars at the end that makes a text bold in your teaching tip for hyperlink you have to do three things anything that you want to hyperlink should be in these brackets and then whatever you want to hyperlink to that should come into these curly braces and then you can open an object by defining the format like this. So let's actually go into customer page and see that. In BC20, if I have BC20 open somewhere. Temp, maybe. Okay. Let's go into the page 21, the customer page. Okay. Customer list. Okay. So these are the two properties that you need. You kind of set that up. And here is that section which talks about anything that you want to have the kind of replacement text, you put it inside this bracket it says customer template and then the link that it need to go to will come into these brackets this is the link that you're creating to that particular object oh sorry that particular object yes which is question mark object type equal to was the object number and then this gives you that tool tip even inside that hyperlink so when you are here on your customers, I have to search for it. What you see on hovering over it is open the customer template. That text comes here. So this is the static uh, way or the defined predefined way of to kind of add an hyperlink in your tool tips or uh, the teaching tip which is the about title, which we all know about text, which was a plain text earlier. Now you can also add hyperlinks into it in the pages. Now as you're talking about it, we didn't talk about the bold thing, but let's quickly look on the item list, which is, I guess, 31. Am I mistyping numbers or what? Page. 31 it used to be yeah it's 31 maybe i was talking wrong so if you see this this is what it makes anything bold on your teaching tip anything any i any text that you place between two stars here and two stars at the end that makes that text bold and then we have seen about the hyperlinking which is also here the item template question mark object type object number and then the text on that link so let's quickly look on the items also oh, sorry okay yeah that makes it bold and then this is that hyperlink that they have added so if a customer asks you to change it you can always do it by creating a page extension uh, on those particular pages you just need to remember this I would not remember even this, but I should know that it's available on the customer card or maybe on the item list because you get all the examples on the item list where how you make it bold on how you set the link to another page if you have to. OK, anybody have actually used teaching teaching tip while they were building their custom solutions or oh, nobody have done it yet? None. Doesn't sound relevant at this point, I guess. But I think it'll be interesting if we add teaching tip uh, with opening 
tables will it work i don't know i'm not sure but i haven't tried it but that would be interesting if i can actually open a table because there are ways to kind of see the table data by going into the table information page and then filtering out your table but can i actually do a table would be interesting i think it's not available today but i'll have to think about it maybe i'll give it a try with all object type and see can it run a code unit from there maybe that'll be useful if i can or uh, can i run a report from teaching tip so i'll give it a try maybe and then we'll see it next week if i if that works or not okay another small thing that they added on the role explorer so if you have noticed in some of the roles or the profiles that we call them in business central when you open those profiles or if they are set for your user you get a guided tour of your instead it was very limited to which role uh, which roles that guided tour was available in the beginning and as as product is moving ahead microsoft is trying to add those guided tour in most of the profiles so like if you see here i don't know which profile i'm in but let me see i'm in a business manager profile and then there is this guided tour about find training on microsoft learn or you can either skip it you can continue it but these kind of guides are being added into other role center pages which where it was not available till now okay so you, you might see them when you're working on it uh, but that's just the only thing that's kind of added on the onboarding side so in business central 19 we were super excited with it um this was only available back then in business central 19 only for the developers because this was <coughs> something which was added inside the VS code to kind of, uh, to have a performance profiler, which is available for SAS as well as for on-prem, which can, at, at the end of your code that you're debugging, will show you the performance of your code, uh, split it by methods, uh, the time that it took per method or per function call, and also provided you the detail of extension from where that code is being executed. Some people have utilized it. I did use it for one or two customers where there was some performance issues. And it was able to kind of pinpoint that, OK, here in this extension, there is some problem. Then at that point, it might be an extension that we have built or maybe an ISV extension, but it was easy to redirect the problem to the right uh, team or the right set of owner of that particular slowness on the process. But at the same time, as we all or most of us come from the NAV background, our consultant have always debugged the NAV processes, not from a perspective of being technical, but actually to see how it is working. And if they think that there is some problem, they were able to kind of send that inputs to developer group and say, Guys, it seems here is some problem. Any time the code comes to this method, it takes so much time. So can you look at this? After announcement of Business Central, especially Business Central 15 and higher, this is something which is very tricky for consultants to actually debug a process that they think it's slow or they, they want to have a look because it needed uh, knowledge about talkers, about VS code, how you connect, if it is SAS, how you connect to the environment, how you, you know, you have to download symbol, you have to put breakpoints, which was not that easier as it used to be in NAV. So what Microsoft have done in this release, is they have also added this cap capability <coughs> for the consultants, for sure, and for the admin users, more or less, on your customer side. With this feature, they can investigate uh, the you know a process when they are working in the client. They don't need a technical expertise or a person who can set up breakpoints and things. They can just start the client performance profiler, do their thing like it's available on the permission thing, 
from base Microsoft. And at the end of it, they can stop the performance provider. And then the system will tell them that, okay, these were the extensions that were being called when you did this process. And this much time, this method or this extension have taken, like you see here, whatever that process was, majority of the time was spent on the base app, some time on the system app, and then some time was on this Microsoft extension for PayPal. Maybe I was posting a sales order or printing a sales order. So that detail and there are additional detail even about the methods and all. <clears throat> the only catch right now is that you cannot run it on behalf of a user. So I cannot say that, oh, uh, Fawzan is using the system and I want to run in client performance profiler for him or her. I'll have to do it on a session where I am in, where I'm involved. So that's kind of the only limitation right now with it. But uh, other than that, you uh, the consultants can come into the central environment, utilize the power of control F1, or you know, if you like to go to help like this, you can go here. And then from here, when you go to help and support, here you see a new action to analyze performance. When you click on analyze performance, it pops up a separate window, says you can start or stop it wherever you think that it's slow. And once you're done with it, you can stop it. So before we click start on this one, let me go back to home page, otherwise it will also record these steps. So let's say I am on my sales order page. All right, and let's try to create a new sales order. So I'll do the start of this process. Come back into this window, go new, choose a customer. Okay, that's all that. Okay, come here. Okay. Luckily or unluckily, I don't have a custom app which is modifying this area of business entity. So I can't actually show you the impact of other things, but there it is. Once you stop it, it shows you that all the time, whatever process you did, it spent all its time on the base app. There's nothing other than base app on the process that you run. So it eliminates that the problem in this area, which I was trying to analyze, is being performed by any other third party extension. I'm very sure now that it's a problem with the base Microsoft app. That eliminates that situation. If you have to go a little bit deep, send your technical more info, you can click on this and then it tells you where it's spent time. And not just that, you can also see per object wise how much time was taken. Different times uh, based on what objects and what code unit is. So if you look at it from the performance side, you will see a surely a higher number somewhere where it takes most of the time when it is executing a certain process. It also gives you the call stack. So you can also see uh, where and how this whole process that you did executed. You did a card page open, then you did, then it did call on after get a card, then it did call your customer number validate, uh, name validate, number validate, quantity validate on different pages and tables. And also the time that it takes around it. At the end of it, if you have to send it to your developer, I'm pretty sure that the download action will download something. Okay, let's download it. Uh, okay. Now this is downloaded, but you can't just open it. So what you need to do is, let's say, we have this up. Now, as a developer, I can come to a business central environment and do an upload of the file which was downloaded earlier and see what my consultant has sent me. I can always come back to my Docker environment, let's say, and upload that file to see, okay, what he has sent rather than getting into a call with him and then saying, okay, let, let me see what you have sent. Okay, it seems that here it is bad or in this extension it is bad. You can actually download and get that file there. I don't think it will share the file directly. 
Okay, yeah. Right. That's something else. But now this is available. So developers that uh, sorry, consultant who always in the developers from the release of business central that they can't debug now. They can and they can also download whatever they found in their performance analysis and send it back to the developer group in their organization and say, okay, guys, here seems that here is some problem. Here's the code that I was able to fetch from customer system or the process. You can upload it and then analyze how it is working for you. So then they know that okay, here they need to focus on rather than getting involved in it, setting up a debugger environment for them and all that. Does that make sense? Anybody have been in those situations which I was explaining in past where they can't debug and they are not happy with it for sure? Well, with the call tree, you could definitely know there's a different way to you can actually track the events used in a specific card or list. There are different ways now. There's the event listener, but this is a new way to do it. Yeah, I guess there is something called as find events in somewhere in the app. Oh, sorry, in the system. Uh, it's event listener, I think. I've used it actually for the uh, duty stamp. <laughs> event. Event um, record. Recorder, recorder, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so when you run a process, it records all the events that has been called in that yeah, process. Yeah. The thing is, you need to start it here, but don't close it, which means you need to say, yeah, have the sales documents and upon this um, page. Right. So you can't stop this. You start it. You, you don't close that now. Yeah, no, I'm going to a page. And then let's oh. try that out. You yeah. To card or yeah. If you haven't, I, I don't use it for some reason because I guess uh, as a developer, we know different ways of doing it. But yeah, well, then yes, I know that works too. Yeah, it does. But that's not how it works. Hang on, hang on. See? Yeah, so you need to be on a separate window. Yeah, I remember now. Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be on two windows, and one window you enable it, and hang then on, on the other window. That's not even how it works. Say that you go back to the sales orders the okay. first time. You need to open the um what's that event recorder, go on to the tell me, yeah. Event recorder. So you start it here. Don't close out the window. Start it. Yes. You can't start, you know, close this. And then you need to call the sales documents on this. Don't close this event recorder. You know, there's a shortcut Alt Q on the keyboard. Shortcut? Yeah, to, you know, to call the sales document list without closing the events recorder. If you close that, it would stop tracking events. So from here. So what if, if I do it here on the separate window? Yeah. Will it not record it? Recorded? No, it's not going to record it. It's like a different session, if you will. Even though it's under the same account, it's not going to do it. I know. I've tried that actually. I know there is a way to use it, but let me see. Does it do something or not? And if I change this, to come here and do stop it. Yeah. Stop. No events are okay. okay. It's the same thing. You need to do it while the event recorder page is open. Okay, so maybe I need to export it out like this. Maybe uh, I'm thinking. That's yeah, I've never tried that. Go on then. Okay, let's do and start. Start recording. Let's go into a sales order. And let's try to change something. That will yeah. trigger an event for sure. Doesn't look like it's good. Okay. No. It doesn't. 30 events oh, recorded. Oh, right. Thank you. We want to display them. So here it is. All your events that are being called in that order when you just did a change on the external document number. Yeah. It did call all these events. The cool part here is that you also get an AI snippet, which you can then use to kind exactly. of copy this. Yeah. yeah. To subscribe to the event member thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, on the similar line, 
the inclined performance profiler is also there, which will help the consultants to kind of fetch the details from there. All right. Before we end this, there are some small ones. Um, uh, there are some navigation changes. Like in the previous release, uh, what they did is they did introduce a peak preview, uh, which had one simple problem that peak preview didn't work on the pages where there was no card page associated. So like if I look on the peak preview feature, you get this uh, dotted line for a master entity that's available. And when you click on it, it'll show you a small preview of that field uh, of that record uh, based on the brick setting that you have set in the design time. But it was not showing this detail on the pages where there was no card page associated to it, like let's say item charges. I guess there are some other than that. When you go into item charges, um, and you go into the view list, you'll see that like the general post product posting group does not have a master. So earlier it was not showing you anything, but now you it shows you a button to open the full list. To open the full list, and it just shows you the detail section of it. If you try this on DC19, it was empty, but now they have changed that to kind of show it uh, there. The cool thing which you don't notice on Business Central that when you expand a fast tab, it brings that tab into focus, which makes it cooler for customer who, you know, who have problem that, oh man, this tab always kind of not visible and then I have to go down and open this tab. So now if you are on a big page where there are multiple tabs like this one, if I try to expand this tab, this tab will automatically move up so that I don't have to then scroll down and go to that area. So it moves the focus up and user don't have to kind of click on this to kind of navigate to that page or open that tab itself. So, oh, there's nothing for, on foreign trade on this one, but yeah, that tab will a small change, but I'm pretty sure users who do quick data entry for them, it'll, it'll help them. That was one on that. I'm not sure who is using telemetry, but they have added so many new telemetry signals, which emits data into telemetry whenever things happen in your environment. Now, there's a whole debate and a discussion about telemetry where Microsoft wanted to make it uh, mandatory for each app, but then it costs you some as something as a partner to analyze the data on telemetry and to store it in Azure. So long story short, the partner community rejected this, that please don't make it mandatory and Microsoft did listen about it. But Microsoft do use the telemetry data that gets emitted from all BC SaaS customer to kind of keep an eye on if something goes wrong in particular, uh, you know, tenant. So they kind of get insight from the data. So on addition of that, they have added these seven, eight new telemetry signal, which will emit data for the telemetry when certain action happens. If there's a partner who is utilizing telemetry, for them it will surely make sense. But I don't know, I haven't heard from most of the partners that they are using telemetry. But this now also helps it in a deadlock situation. It provides you the page or the code that causes that in the telemetry. Uh, what else? Yeah, it also gives you a pseudo user ID that who, you, what user is being used while this action is happening in the telemetry. It also emits the company name, which it was not doing in the past. <coughs> when a log record is done. So now you can point to a company when a problem is shown in your telemetry signals that you're seeing. Also from your SaaS environments, when you do a rename or deletion or creation of a new environment, that data is also available in telemetry now, kind of analyze if required. So these are the new instances of telemetry that's being added in Business Central 20 at this moment. And rest we'll see next week. What else is left? There's nothing much left, I guess, now, but we'll cover whatever is left there maybe next week. 
Okay. So enjoy your Sunday and then see you next Saturday then. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Sarah. Bye. Bye. Sarah, any chance yeah. you're working on that Excel template? Excel, Excel, external data in Excel? Yeah. Yes, I did do something. And yeah, anybody who want to stay, that's OK. Anybody who want to leave, that's also OK. Mm. Let me show you, sir. What I was trying to do is I did create a data set, which is this. So this is the same report which you were dealing last week. Now, as I was saying, I'm not that expert into <clears throat> the space. So what I was trying to do is I did build a sample demo database where I used the customers. Fake data, more or less. And I tried to bring that in. It comes as like this. Like there are three customers which have the same number for the you know to create the link. And then it loads the data. <clears throat> so now I have this data set, which will also I'm hoping will refresh when I pop up the sheet. And I'm pretty sure otherwise I can set up a property to auto refresh this data. I'm pretty sure there is a way to kind of auto refresh this. I'm hoping. Otherwise, we'll see that. But then how I do link these two is my question. I was trying to play with this power pivot option. I don't know what else can I do to kind of merge two data set. Maybe a macro. Yeah, maybe a macro will surely do. I might have to kind of play with that. But macros but are not run in business entry, right? You don't have to worry about it because Business Central doesn't deal with the other tabs that you have. So like if I have this, uh, the only rule that Microsoft has is don't change these two tabs. That's the only thumb rule. That's listed as of, as of today. So what I'm thinking, but, even uh, if I... But the refresh, the data refresh that is happening, which will bring the external data, this will come through uh, when the Excel function is being called, the refresh. Yeah, that so will not get called from business from, right? No, the business entry will just update this sheet, right? Based on whatever mm -hmm. the filter that user have applied. Once that file gets downloaded and you try to open it, you can invoke your uh, macro to kind of update this data set, maybe. And then the merge as well. Yeah, so can we just put a simple plus plus after this of the uh, some data from there? If there is numerical value there. Yeah, I can. That that's for sure. But what I was thinking is I, I saw somewhere that there is an merge action of data set somewhere. I don't know where it is. So just in connection, manage data model. Is it here? No. Not here. I clicked somewhere. <laughs> that's why I was thinking maybe I have to learn see, uh, Excel now. Mm, add to data model. What is this? No. Detect. Okay, no. Manage. Manage. No. Why this all is going here and not bringing me the wall? There is surely a way uh, because at the end of the day, what it is is this is a named table, right? Mm. This is data. Yes. And this is another name table. So I mm. somehow need to merge these two name table into one single entity so that I can then utilize that entity to do whatever I want to do after that. So what I will do is I will have a look at it. And then uh, maybe I'm, send you some example. Or the yeah, link. I, yeah, I think I saw it somewhere. Don't it must be there. It doesn't seem to be too or a thing. That yes, somebody, here somebody is something do. called as relationship, right? A consolidation, maybe. Let's see what it is. Some. Uh, no, this is some count mm. average min max product. Turned it up. No, this is something else. But then, what is the relationship? My laptop has gone. Crazy. Oh, 
hang hang on the mobile now. Oh, yes. so, it. <laughs> so it did create a relationship. I don't know what it will be used for, but it did create one. And then now I've had to consolidate. No, there's nothing to use. But I'm pretty sure there's something that I saw somewhere. So I will find some. Um, oh, article. it did bring now the two two relationship data uh, here when I clicked on this power pivot. Now, if we can apply this model, the data will come in the consolidated model. Refresh diagram view. Okay, it did relate those two tables based on that key. Data view. Now, what I can do? Add. Okay, add a column if I have to. Freeze with manage relationship data table set default. Create and manage. So default field set table behavior. Field in this table default field in order. Create and manage. Okay. Uh, what a blue screen. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, but yeah, I'm pretty sure there are ways to kind of link these two. And once we can figure that out, because that's the only catch. If we can figure out how to link these two data items and create a one consolidated view out of it, that will give us what, what we wanted out of it. Just I'm sure I will be able to figure out. No, that I am not an expert of Excel, but yeah. Can, That's what can, you look, uh, can you also look the code that I shared in the chat? Yes, I will open that. Okay, procedure. Okay. Copy that. Okay. Mm. Okay, go out to you on SharePoint that get app code. SharePoint setup. Oh, this is your custom table? SharePoint setup. I don't think. Yeah, uh, it's my custom. Yeah. Okay. But again, the, the main thing is this O2 uh, table, one of the functions that I have called. So you just are using the tenant ID, the secrets, and the client ID from there, and then the redirect URL from there. And maybe I'm surely doing something wrong on either of these. I did. I'll I'll recreate that. What Microsoft is doing? They're given some ten, twelve methods, different different yes. methods in this old. And uh, some of them are retiring, and I was super confused which one to use. <laughs> I, that makes sense. The MSN uh, which gave that uh, reference yeah. that is not duplicated. That function oh. is not duplicated. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I'll give it a try because. <clears throat> I guess if I can get the token, then I'll and then start working on the rest of the things of uploading file because I did read on MSDN that there is a REST API call that you can do to upload a file to SharePoint. Up to SharePoint. SharePoint. No. Yes. Yeah. I will publish something. I will try to publish something because I have tested it. It's working. Yeah, because that's but I, I, you I know, have to they, find that code. The requirement that I'm working on doesn't need a full fledged SharePoint integration. They just want to make sure that any file that they uh, that they are downloading. So at the end of the day, what they are doing is they are downloading a file, let's say a PDF, okay, from a process. But for their other system, they just want to make sure that their file also gets stored into a shared file, which they wanted to move to SharePoint. We said, okay, we'll. The only thing that they want is to have that file also stored in SharePoint on a predefined path. The customer is on SaaS? Yes, the customer is on SaaS. Then Blob will make more sense if the client agrees. 
Yes, that that surely makes sense. It's even cheaper than SharePoint. Yes, <laughs> from the cost perspective. But I don't know there are other integration that they are working with, which needed the file on SharePoint. I guess maybe. Yeah. I will send yeah. you something. Sure. I send you something. Okay. I I made it worked, but then kind of lo lost how to you know how to manage it, and I got busy with the thirty first March thing. <laughs> how to find that code? Okay, uh, not a problem. If you find it, that's good. Otherwise, I'll I'll I'll, I'll figure it out. I guess in a day or two. Because I first wanted to do the OAuth because once I get the token, then I'm pretty sure rest will figure that out as we go forward. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye.